r slash no sleep posted by you slash gray building 679 i was part of a reality survival based tv show the footage will never air part one i'll never forget the day my buddy from college mark quiner gave me a call mark had been out in hollywood directing for the last few years and was well on his way to making a name for himself after successfully executing several reality tv shows all which did exceptionally well at the time I was down on my luck. My girlfriend, Tracy, of four years had just broken up with me, I was living in an apartment I could barely afford, and working at a failing rideshare startup. When Mark called, it felt like a hand was reaching down and saving me from my shit existence. Rescuing me from my sweltering studio apartment with no AC, my jerk boss with bad breath and a greasy comb over, and even my friends who I had come to resent over the years, with their silicone wives and adder all filled children. He was working on a new show, which he pitched as a survival show, similar to Alone, but extreme. He went on to tell me that they would drop five participants off the coast of Maine on a series of abandoned islands. The islands would be strung up with video equipment designed to catch the survivalists every move. What made this show different was that there would be no emergency extractions, no check-ins, or medical examinations. Mark and his team would come out once a month to see if anyone was ready to tap, but besides that, the participants were completely on their own. The last person standing would win $1 million. I fully expect someone to die, said Mark with glee over the phone. It will make great television. Where did I come in? Mark said he would pay me almost double what I was making at the moment to be his assistant on set. In reality, I think he felt sorry for me, and he wanted someone who he could hang out with for possibly six months. We were to be based along with the rest of the production team in Blue Harbor, a small coastal village with a population under 2000. I readily agreed, packing up my suitcase and cancelling my lease. I sent Tracy a final text message letting her know that I was leaving. It was left on read, with no reply. What happened to this day still terrifies me. Almost six years later I still wake up to the nightmares, anxious, my sheets soaked through with sweat. Sometimes I'll be doing a random task like grocery shopping feeling completely normal and it will hit me, becoming paralyzed with guilt. I can still see their faces sometimes. The network terminated the official footage for the show, they would have been deemed monsters if they ever aired what happened. I still have the collection of SD cards for what was recorded on the participants' GoPros but I don't have the stomach to look at it again. I flew into Portland, driving a cheap rental car to Blue Harbor. The participants were already there on day 5 of an extensive boot camp, before heading to their individual sites. There were 5 people in all. Peter was the oldest of the bunch, a former merchant marine. He was a surly fellow nearing 60 with a wealth of military experience. Nate was the second oldest at almost 48. Having worked on Wall Street for most of his life, a midlife crisis changed his life. After divorcing his wife, he along with his 24-year-old girlfriend moved up to a commune in Vermont to reconnect with nature. The youngest was named Jimmy, a fresh-faced college graduate, who studied primitive living. There were two women. Leanne was an herbalist who grew up on a Navajo reservation and now lived off the grid on the border of Washington and Canada. The last member of the group was Clara, a mom of two boys under three, and a breast cancer survivor. She had a fierce look about her, and according to her bio, was desperate to win the money. For their last night on the mainland, we took the participants to the only restaurant in Blue Harbor a rundown joint called the Wella. It was a warm fall night, and we all drank and ate heartily. I was sat next to Clara, who polished off two cheeseburgers and three pints of dark beer. We talked about her family and life in South Carolina. I learned that she had barely survived cancer, that she was in remission and it was only a matter of time before she relapsed. She was determined to win, as she needed the money for her sons. I knew I shouldn't have favorites, but I was rooting for her to win. Hey Chris, said Mark yelling towards me at the end of the table. Get the check, and let's get out of here. We paid and left the restaurant. When we got outside Peter lit up a cigarette, exhaling deeply he said he figured it would be his last one for a while. Leanne asked for a drag, and there was a flirtatious look between the both of them, that made me blush. Mark had rented a fine house on the outskirts of town, where we, along with three other members of production would be based for the duration of the filming. As I went to bed I saw Leanne sneak by heading towards Peter's room. She gave me a wink and said goodnight. The next morning there was an air of seriousness as we prepared to drop off the contestants. The Blue Islands were about a hundred miles away from Blue Harbor resting on the invisible border between the United States and Canada. There were about 60 or so land masses spread out across 20 miles. According to Mark they were all inhospitable and uninhabitable, 
making them perfect for his purposes. I looked around at the participants, their now hardened faces were devoid of any of last night's merriment. Even Leanne, the most gregarious of them, was still and silent. As the morning fog began to disperse, I could see the islands in front of us, the looked like dinosaurs emerging from the water, ancient forgotten things. We dropped the contestants off one by one, each to their own private island. Nate was the last person, a smug smile on his face, he gave high fives all around, see you in six months, he said getting off the boat. For the first month, things were relatively quiet as we settled into our new lives in Blue Harbor, Maine. Truth be told, it was the most relaxing month of my life. I started running again, going down to the beach for my daily morning jog. Mark had a catering team from Portland deliver our meals, which were made with fresh fruits and vegetables, and organic farm-raised meats. I found my pants getting looser and my skin clearing up. I could feel the seasons begin to change as a cold chill ran through the air, the days become shorter, our shadows stretched further. Blue Harbor constricted as well with summer tourists taking leave along with the seasonal workers, the small town felt even smaller. At the end of the first month, we all loaded back into the boat to check on the survivalists. The rules were simple. If a participant wished to leave they would meet us at the drop-off point. If they wished to continue, they would leave just their GroPro SD cards in a plastic bag at the drop-off, but stand at least six feet away. Mark was a stickler that there should be no interaction between them and the crew, but still wanted to verify that they were still alive. The plan was to leave more SD cards and camera batteries and come back again in a month. Mark was excited to start viewing the footage and begin editing. He had investors and studio executives that were equally anxious. We started by going to Nate's site, and then Peter and Jimmy. They all looked a bit thinner but gave friendly waves to us from a distance. Afterward, we went to Clara, who stood motionless from afar, and finally to Leanne. I was disappointed to see Leanne perched right on the rocks of the drop-off, moving her hands frantically. I knew she would be the first to go, Mark said snidely. As we pulled up the boat, Leanne threw herself onto the vessel, gripping her bag. I passed her an apple and a bottle of water, as Jesse our cameraman began to pepper her with questions. Why did you decide to tap? Jesse said, focusing his lens on her, but Leanne refused to answer any of his inquiries, something which infuriated Mark. She stayed in the boat while we went around the island collecting the camera equipment. It was smaller than I expected, the shoreline rocky and unusable it came up from the beach plateauing into a grid of interlocking trees. I could see the traces of Leanne's sight, now stripped bare. All that remained were the remnants of a rock fire pit. When we got Leanne back to Blue Harbor she began to seem more like her normal self, the color in her cheeks appearing, her eyes softening. She agreed to give a final interview and Mark decided to conduct it in the backyard of the house so that it appeared like she was still at her sight. Standing in front of several trees, Jessie tried again, asking her why she decided to leave. I couldn't do it, Leanne said, it felt like all the air was gone in that place like I was on top of Mount Everest. It just felt bad. What was the hardest part of the experience for you? Jesse said, pushing back his red curly hair. The blood roots, Leanne said, her eyes drifting. What's that now? Jesse said. The roots were bleeding, Leanne said again. Jesus, Jesse just cut it, Mark said disgruntled. She out of her mind, he mumbled under his breath. Leanne went to the room sleeping for the next 10 hours. Mark had arranged a car to pick her up and take her to the airport the next morning. I was at the breakfast table when she came downstairs, getting ready to leave. Hey you off? I said, helping myself to another serving of cereal. Coming over to the table Leanne let out a sigh. Chris, I don't know how to explain it, but something felt wrong out there on the island. I was mid-chew and put down my spoon. Sorry? I can't be positive what I saw, and maybe I did imagine some things, but I think it was real. She sounded confused. Just check the tapes, okay? I gave a nod and gave her a hug goodbye. When she was gone, I went into the makeshift editing room that Mark and Jesse had set up and went to the computer. The SD cards were stacked in their bags, and I found Leanne's placing it in the computer. A video came up, and Leanne's face came into view, with a big smile, she placed the camera in front of her showing off the scenery, the ocean stretched into the horizon. It sure is something, huh? Leanne went around, giving a tour of the land, she showed her favorite tree an old birch that she had taken to naming cow, due to its black and white pattern. She had constructed an A-frame shelter, made of wood she had found, placing grass on the roof. She must have dismantled it before we came, it looked impressive. I fast-forwarded through several days of filming, 
as Leanne struggled to create fire and find sources of fresh water. She went about trying to fish along the coastline, dancing with excitement when she finally succeeded. This is the best meal of my life, she said, ripping into the charred skin. It made me smile. I stopped when Leanne's face came into the frame, this time her demeanor had changed, her mouth pulled downwards a look of uncertainty in her eyes. I have to show you guys this. Leanne still in view was walking, I came on it the other day when I was down at the beach, and I don't know what to make of it. Scaling over several rocks the camera trembled, before something came into view, it was red and wet, a mass of something that looked almost like an open body cavity. The camera went out further, and I was able to see what I was looking at. It was a tree with its roots exposed they were covered in a sticky red substance that almost looked like meat. What is this? Leanne said, I can tell you it smells real awful. She let out a chuckle. It's all along these trees too, look. The camera went to several other root systems that looked similar. I mean, maybe it's some sort of biological thing, but I have never heard of this. Neither had I. I continued watching. Leanne seemed to be obsessed over the trees, visiting them on a daily basis and getting more concerned as time went on. At one point she took her knife, slicing it into her finger, to capture some of her own blood, comparing it to what was the tree's base. It feels the same and it looks the same, but is it the same? She said looking at her reddened fingers. On day 20 Leanne went quiet, after that she didn't talk anymore and would only occasionally turn on her GoPro, while she sat glued to the drop-off point. I checked the tapes that we recovered on the island but there was nothing else that seemed odd. I showed Mark the video of the bloodied roots. That's disgusting. You think an animal got caught in there and tore itself to bits? Mark said staring at the screen. Look, it's with a bunch of the trees, I said freezing the frame. I've read about that. Said Jesse, popping his head in, there are trees that if you cut them, it looks like blood, creepy as hell. Mystery solved then, said Mark, cupping my shoulder. Jesse go over this and try to get some semblance of a storyline for Leanne, I'm thinking old lady goes out to woods and realizes she can't hack it. Leanne could hack it though of that I was certain. I went over the other GoPro video we had from the other contestants, and nothing seemed amiss. Peter and Nate were doing exceptionally well, and Jimmy had pretty much constructed a log cabin. I checked Clara's footage, she talked about how she missed her family and had some trouble constructing a shelter, finally finding along the shoreline where she made her camp. I paused it two days before we came for the pickup, when I saw the same facial expression that I saw in Leanne. Clara looked scared. I pressed play. Something strange happened last night, she said, looking out onto the water. I think it may have been a ship, but I saw these small glittery lights dancing on the water's surface. It was beautiful. Shrugging her shoulders, maybe it's my boys telling me they miss me, a gift from nature. As it would turn out the glittery lights and the grotesque roots were gifts from nature just not in the way I could ever imagine.